and Wong Stream Speaks and in this video I'm going to go through hypertension, in particular the different stages of hypertension, um, the hypertension pathway and we'll also cover a bit on diabetes and pregnancy as well. So I'm calling these BNF bite size information um, and videos for you to really summarise those real key topics and areas um, to make it easier for your revision needs. And if you do like this video, then please do give it a thumbs up, share, like, subscribe. Do also visit my Facebook, Instagram and Twitter as well. So hypertension, high blood pressure. First and foremost, with anyone that has high blood pressure, we need to give lifestyle advice. So for example, increasing exercise uptake, um, having a healthier diet, reducing our salt intake, reducing alcohol content, uh, alcohol intake if that's applicable. And what I would say is when giving counselling to a patient who, um, for example, if they are overweight and they have hypertension and you're trying to motivate them to actually live a healthier lifestyle, saying things like you should be healthier or you should exercise is actually quite counterproductive and not everybody knows what being healthier actually means. So by providing examples for a patient can actually be really helpful and also by using techniques such as motivational interviewing, that's a real skill as well and if that isn't something that you're familiar with then do check up on that because motivational interviewing is a great technique to use um, when for example for smoking cessation or for situations like this where you're trying to motivate an individual to live a healthier lifestyle. So for example, instead of saying to a patient, you should really do some exercise, you should go for a run at 5am every single day. I mean, if anyone said that to me, I would just completely ignore them because that isn't something which would be appealing to me at all. Sleep is way too precious to for me to be waking up at 5am going for a run. Just not going to happen. But actually by saying to somebody, okay, um, exercise is really important. What exercise activities appeal to you? You're putting the ball in their court and then you're allowing a person to actually think about what activities they like, um, what exercise regimes actually work for them. Well, actually I get a spare half an hour in a day um, just before lunchtime, maybe that's a, an opportunity where I can go for a walk or um, I can go for a jog or whatever it may be, but actually tailoring counselling um, and advice to a patient rather than just giving generic advice is a lot more effective. So that's just something to bear in mind. So with hypertension, there's different stages. We've got stage one, stage two and severe. So stage one hypertension can be defined as having a clinic blood pressure reading between 140 over 90 and 160 over 100 mmHg. Stage two hypertension can be defined as having a clinic blood pressure reading between 160 over 100 and 180 over 120 mmHg. And regardless of age, everyone with um, or anyone with stage two hypertension would be treated, um, non-pharmacological advice, would be required as well, definitely, um, but they would also need to be started on treatment as well. And in the case of severe hypertension, that's defined as a clinic blood pressure reading above 180 over 120 mmHg, and that would require specialist referral. What's also worth noting is that cardiovascular risk should be estimated and assessed for all patients with confirmed hypertension using those clinic blood pressure measurements. Now let's talk about the actual um, pathway that is used in hypertension and what antihypertensive antihypertensives should be used depending on a patient's age, comorbidities and ethnicity. So starting off with patients that have type 2 diabetes regardless of what age they are. So patients that have hypertension and they have existing type 2 diabetes. Also in the category, we're going to include patients that have hypertension, but they don't have diabetes, but they are under 55 years old and they are not of Black African or African Caribbean origin. So all those patients that I've just mentioned, all that category, they follow the ACD module, model. So think of it like the alphabet, but we're missing out B. So ACD. So first and foremost, we would start these patients with an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, so an angiotensin receptor blocker. Our ACE inhibitors are 
They tend to be our ills, so Ramapril, Lisinopril, Captopril. Um, our ARBs tend to be our TAN, so Ibisartan, Candesartan, etc. Um, usually ACE inhibitor is started first, but if the patient experiences side effects, which um, is really affecting their day-to-day -day activities, typical example is a dry cough with ACE inhibitors, then you would put them onto the ARB. But all of that is step one. Now, if step one wasn't enough to manage and maintain a person's blood pressure um, or to reduce their blood pressure, we would then add C, a calcium channel blocker. And these tend to be our pines, amlodipine, lecanidipine, for example. We would also offer a thiazide-like diuretic for um, a patient who has any evidence of heart failure. But if they don't have evidence of heart failure, then at this step, it would purely be the ACE inhibitor or the ARB, wouldn't be the two together, one or the other, plus the calcium channel blocker. So we've had our A, we've had our C, now let's move to our D, our thiazide like diuretic. That's where the D comes in. And an example of that is endapamide. So a person would be on all those three. So we started off with just the one medicine. Step one was only one medicine, ACE inhibitor or ARB. Step two was two medicines, ACE inhibitor or ARB plus a calcium channel blocker. And our step three would be then three medicines, ACE inhibitor or ARB, plus our calcium channel blocker, plus our thiazide-like diuretic, like endapamide. And if they still being on all those three still didn't help um, bring down a person's blood pressure, um, didn't manage or monitor it, then we would have to, be, they would then be referred to specialist advice. Parking that for a moment, the next pathway that we're going to look at is those that have hypertension without type 2 diabetes, but in a person who is over 55 years old and a person of any age of Black African or African Caribbean origin, again, without type 2 diabetes. So in this group of patients, all we do is swap step one and two around. So whereas in the previous example, we had ACD, in this example, we now have CAD. So our first and initial uh, first line treatment would be a calcium channel blocker. If that wasn't adequate, we would then add an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. If that still was inadequate, then we would add that thiazide like diuretic. How easy is that to remember? So, so long as you remember the one set, just swap options one and two around for the second set. Nice and easy. So with diabetes, we mentioned that with type 2 diabetes, you would start with an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. What's worth bearing in mind, though, is say, for example, you have a scenario where you have Joe Bloggs, who is a 50 year old patient and they're of Caucasian origin and they currently take metformin, 500 milligrams, glycoside, 80 milligrams, um, atorvastatin, 20 milligrams and Rampril, 1.25 milligrams. Made up example. So with this patient, you might think, OK, they're Caucasian in origin. We can work out that they have type 2 diabetes because they take metformin and they take glycoside and they're under 55 years old. That must mean that their ramipril is being used as their antihypertensive. And you would be safe in assuming that. Um, however, look at the dose, 1.25 milligrams. This could be used as an antihypertensive, but it's more likely that it's being used for um, nephropathy instead. So whilst it's important to know what medicines can be used, it's also in, in anti, as, a, as an antihypertensive, it's also worth noting what different doses are used for different conditions. So yes, could be used in this situation as an antihypertensive, but in this situation with diabetic patients, ACE inhibitors might be used for nephropathy instead. So that's just something worth bearing in mind. And with type 1 diabetes, you would aim for a clinic blood pressure reading of below 135 over 85 mmHg. And you would go with an, an angiotensin receptor blocker um, generally with type 1 diabetes. So now let's talk about pregnancy. And with pregnancy, generally, you would refer to a specialist. And depending on when the hypertension happens and its severity within pregnancy, it's called different things. So chronic hypertension is defined as hypertension that exists before pregnancy. So it's an existing um, state that a person has before they're getting pregnant or they're diagnosed with it in the first 20 weeks of gestation. 
So that is chronic hypertension. Then you have gestational hypertension, and gestational hypertension is hypertension after 20 weeks of gestation. And then there's also preeclampsia. Preeclampsia is very severe. Um, it can happen after those 20 weeks of um, after 20 weeks gestation, um, with features of multi-organ involvement as well. And symptoms can include a severe headache, swelling of the hands, feet, face, as an example. And pregnant women who have chronic hypertension, so if they have existing hypertension before they got pregnant or before 20 weeks gestation, then um, they should be referred to a specialist for their antihypertensives to be reviewed because ACE inhibitors, ARBs, thiazide, thiazide-like diuretics, all of those should be stopped um, as the risk of congenital, there is an increased risk of congenital abnormalities with those medicines. So what do we give in pregnancy? So first line with pregnancy would be labetalol. That is the first line treatment. However, if that doesn't help, then what can be given instead is nifedipine. But it's worth bearing in mind that nifedipine is actually unlicensed. Um, if that doesn't help, then another one that we could actually give is methyl dopa, but that too is unlicensed. So it's just worth bearing in mind. Now, if a woman has been taking methyl dopa during her pregnancy, then actually it should be discontinued two days, within two days after giving birth and switch to an alternative antihypertensive instead. Now, do refer to the BNF um, if you want more information. As I mentioned, this is bite-sized information for you um, to try and summarise antihypertensive in diabetes, in pregnancies, and look at those pathways as well. So as mentioned before, do check out my socials. Please do share the love. Really appreciate it if you could hit that subscribe button too. And until next time, good luck with your revision and happy revisings.